Do we start or? Okay, okay, right. Okay. Hello, good morning. Um, so through this presentation, we go through. Uh, this is the agenda of presentation. is is more to show how you can get the 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 new system that uh, has been developed installed for your region or any site specific uh, or site of interest. Um, and this presentation will cover three main points uh, uh, to get it done. The first is we talk about the the collection of uh, what are the required data, input data, and the where to collect this data from. Uh, the second will be on the installation of the platform and how to integrate uh, the input data. And finally. A static data, it, it's, it's more about um, the hazard information of your site's uh, specific site and the exposure and the vulnerability. Um, the hazard is, is basically about collecting um, uh, the seismic hazard condition or information related to seismic hazard condition of your region. And these are usually the existing probabilistic seismic hazard map uh, that you can find in many of the guidelines at regional or national level. So these are usually uh, available at uh, relevant um, national or regional uh, uh, institution, um, like, uh, and mostly they are developed by seismologists. Right. And then you get, uh, as, as a second layer, in order to model the hazard, you need information about the ground surface. Uh, this is mostly for VS30 uh, in order to take into account the impact or the uh, amplification uh, effect of site. Uh, because um, in case you are sitting in soft soil or hard soil, this makes quite a difference uh, when generate uh, ground shaking. Uh, the second layer um, that is required as a static data, it's everything that that define the existing exposure, starting by the the buildings, or stock in your region, or infrastructures. So you need to have those information uh, uh, integrated in the in the system. Uh, of course, with the GIS coordinate because this is quite important. Uh, GIS coordinate of all the in. Uh, 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 the building stock and the infrastructures, and then you you identify the typology because this is also a, a parameters that allows to uh, better uh, estimate the potential impact or um, predict the physical impact of an earthquake typology and also the occupancy class uh, because this will be linked to a number of people who will be inside or outside of that building or that infrastructures plus the 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 population distribution that will be linked to it and economy data if you want or if you are interested to to have a, 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 a economic impact uh, uh, computed when you are running the, the platform but it's not a requirement so there are mandatory and there are non-mandatory uh, input data and as, a, as usually so this kind of data you can get it from an existing uh, relevant uh, institution in your region or uh, on your place. So, and usually this data can be developed and prepared by engineers, um, uh, uh, social science uh, economists. So these are data usually are available. And the last one is uh, is uh, to uh, to identify the level of um, uh, vulnerability of. Uh, of your building stock or infrastructures. So this is basically what the engineers can deliver to you for when you are classifying the typology of your data. Now, uh, from static data, so all the static data are basically um, is prepared in advance and then it will be integrated into a platform. Now, for the dynamic data, uh, this is data you get when your platform is running on 
and then it's connected and then it's whenever there is an event the dynamic data start coming yeah and the dynamic data is mostly related to seismic data uh, uh, that you, you you get from a given event uh, event catalog data uh, plus the ground shaking data that will come later and then you have uh, other, this is the only one which is mandatory then we have other type of data which is um, um, non seismic data and smartphone data they are not uh, they are not mandatory um, yeah this is usually the, for the seismic data it's usually available uh, you get it from your regional or national seismic network stations so uh, through a relevant organization that are operating this kind of uh, stations basically you get in touch with them and then they connect the network to your uh, system no. Um, right. Installation of the platform and integration of input data. So um, the installation will have three main phases uh, of the platform. So the phase number one is to install the uh, to uh, to uh, to to put this instrumental network. In. And then you have the the second phase is the installation of the scientific engine. And then the third phase is the end user uh, interface installation. And through this presentation, we will go for each one of them uh, to define what are the prerequisites for it and what are the human resources that you will be required in order to to implement this phase and the workflow uh, just um, in a very simple way. So for the instrumental network installation, I will just give it to Ben and then he will go through it and then uh, we'll come back. Okay, so we are talking now about the installation of the Raspberry Shake. So that's the sensors, uh, which is a mix of a weak motion sensor um, for smaller earthquakes and a strong motion uh, with the MEMS sensors. Um, the installation of these shakes are, is very easy. Some of you have already experience. So we don't need a, a very complex uh, setup. So it's mainly it's power and internet what we require. So depending on your knowledge, you have different options. So the, um, the institutes uh, have some kind of technical knowledge with, with sensors. They are connecting um, typically the devices with the VPN to their central system. And the Raspberry Shakes uh, are um, automatically updating their firmware. So you just keep it running. If there's a new version of the, of the firmware of the Raspberry Shake, it's just pulling it over the internet and is updating the sensor. So this would be um, here now more the um, the installation, how the more um, yes, the seismic institutes would do it. There's another possibility. So there is each Raspberry Shakes comes with a web interface where you connect to. We give the coordinates and um, whatever um, a name and an email address for, for contact. And there's also an option to click data forwarding. So when you click that option, the, the data is forwarded to the Raspberry Shake platform, and from there you can retrieve the data again. So that is very, very simple. So uh, like the, the network of, of Oklahoma in the US, they purchased 100 Raspberry Shakes, and they just handed it out to the population. Uh, so the, they just had very short instructions, just giving it coordinates, so it's a map where you click on. You uh, activate the data forwarding, and from then they are getting the data again from this uh, Raspberry Shake platform. Uh, it could be in the same way, certainly also from the Turnkey platform. So this is uh, so there are two options for um, institutes which have a higher technology, uh, technical knowledge. They do have uh, VPN connections because they have a bit more control um, about the sensors itself. But uh, less experienced users, they can uh, only use that data forwarding and then um, the, the whole data acquisition part is automatically covered. So still, um, you need um, kind of um, yeah, energy power setup, but that is uh, typical electricity. So we are talking here about a, a short period and a strong motion sensors. So that means we don't have a, um, a complicated setup as we would have typically with uh, seismic broadband stations. So that's what the seismic institutes would set up. So uh, normally it's enough that you, if you find a quiet place in the building 
or if it's uh, somewhere in the, in the garden of a residential uh, garden, you can put the, the sensors up there. Um, we are um, talking here about damaging earthquakes, so um, whatever human noise um, the sensor is normally recording, if there's a damaging earthquake, um, the signal to noise ratio will be so high that the, um, the sensor definitely will pick up the, um, the data. So the instrument installation is, is straightforward. Um, so you can yeah, just give it out to, to normal people, let's say, and, and just um, <clears throat> let them install them. Um, the maintenance is not really required, so um, we have a lot of experience. Normally, these sensors are run for, for years, so I have one in my garden, which is now uh, running for five years without any problem. So um, the only thing what, what might happen is that the small SD card, so these are sometimes failing, then you just replace the SD card and um, system is, is up again. So that would be the kind of maintenance, but um, these sensors are very stable. Also within the turnkey project, we didn't have failures of the sensors. I think uh, one in Greece happened, uh, but that the, the whole world was uh, flooded by water. So, okay, so there's nothing you can do around about that. So the network management, um, yeah, the setup is depending on how you integrated um, these sensors, if you integrate it into your national network or um, if you um, collect the data then from, this, uh, from the platform itself. So this is a kind of the VPN client software installation is a kind of optional component. Preparing the Raspberry Shake 4D, um, so now it depends a bit. So we have in the Turkey project, we have color, uh, so we have seismic only sensors. The setup there is, uh, is pretty straightforward, it's as I described. But we have also co-located um, sensors which have a GNSS sensor attached. And there, there are some more um, requirements. So there's a special module we have to, um, so there's a special firmware which you have to copy on the shakes um, to, to be able to uh, collect the data from the GNSS sensor, and then uh, the, the Raspberry Shake itself is, is pushing the seismic data and the GNSS data to the, to the central server. So, but this is more or less kind of, of optional, depending if you, if you have a co-located GNSS sensor or not. So, the, um, starting the acquisition, that is more, more or less a button which you click in the web interface, uh, so then um, it's done. The GNSS receiver uh, firmware, again, that is a kind of, of optional component. So it depends. Um, so we have a very few um, co-located sensors here. I think the, the typical um, setup is just to have, to have the seismic data. OK, so that's your part. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so. Yeah, the scientific engine is consists of a set of processes uh, running in uh, Docker containers. Uh, the computer requirements that are uh, that would need for a minimal case, uh, we would need some somewhere around a powerful workstation. Uh, but more computer power uh, give faster results, and it also depends on the size of the test area and exposure data and so on. Yes, and um, yeah, to, to help setting it up, we have a virtual machine with some sample data and uh, scripts for, for running the setup. Um, um, we need to have a PostgreSQL database running. Um, uh, a minimal setup would be what I uh, what we have there, uh, around four CPUs and 16 gigabytes memory, but more is better even there. So and uh, for the for the virtual uh, yeah for the installer uh, we don't need that much memory, but. Um, for, for the processing uh, components, especially the uh, EW, REN, OEF, we need uh, yeah, 
the more CPUs and memory, the better. Uh, yeah. So on the human resources needed, uh, yeah, we need seismologists because the trickiest part is probably setting up all the runtime parameters uh, for shake maps and for um, vulnerability and so on. And uh, earthquake engineers, the same there. Uh, we need to have um, IT competence, uh, database administrator. We we need to have someone to maintain the processes. And uh, yeah, if and setting up the connection with the GUI and the and the net, uh, com, uh, the data, yeah, the GEMPA network. Uh, and we, there are also site-specific information that may be needed for so end-user competencies. Um, yeah, that's about it, I think. And so the, the last part to install is the uh, end user interface, the one that uh, we show that display the, the values. And uh, you need two virtual machine, or of course, if you want, uh, you can use a physical server. And uh, one is for the geographical part and the other one is for the data part. And these are the uh, requirement of the uh, virtual machine, and uh, they, they are running on Windows. I put uh, 229, this is the one that we used. You will need two database, so there is a need an instance of a SQL Server database and a Postgres uh, uh, database for the geographical data. Then, of course, you will have some networking issue. In fact, there is the, the need to have communication with the uh, part, uh, the engine uh, installed by, provided by NORSA, they are to talk each other. And if you want to use the app, or uh, if you want to expose the system over the internet, you have to give uh, uh, open access. Then, of course, according to the usage that you want to do of the application, you have to uh, identify the, let's say, the disaster recovery features of, uh, of the application. What uh, you need, uh, um, this part, uh, you, in, in reality, it's uh, very easy for the part of the application because you have just to uh, put uh, uh, some data inside then we will have it's more a question of network management and of database. Of course, then we will need to make the uh, configuration. So you, you, you will need to put your user, your contact list, your data, but there is, you can import them or there is also the user interface itself that can, can help and can do it manually. So the, the process is quite simple. So first start one virtual machine and then the configuration. Start from the geographical one, then the other one, then put the database that are preset, then you have to configure the platform. You, you have uh, the first uh, user, and then you can make all the configuration you need. OK. Abdel, it's this. Uh, no, this is not running uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, okay. Now this is just as I explained yesterday. So when once we have you have installed your platform, then you run you select some kind of scenarios and you can run a boost simulation in order to make sure that everything is working, uh, as well as it helps you to calibrate the models that are integrated or methodologies. Um, yeah, um, I think that's it, so it's just this. Plus, of course, it includes kind of uh, 
you need kind of building uh, capacity buildings uh, for those who will be using uh, or uh, using either the platform or being part of it in, in, during an emergency situation. Yeah, thank you. So if you have a question.